Hey guys, so I have to admit something. I know I've done a bunch of videos over the last couple of years about music gear and tutorials about being a live musician, but I've been deceiving you this whole time actually. Actually, sometimes when I perform live, I use an iPad on stage. So I'm actually not a real musician. At least that's the vibe that you're gonna get if you go through the comment section or threads on music related posts. They go to like a Facebook group or a Reddit thread or a YouTube comment section. Anytime someone posts something about, oh, I'm looking for an app that does this or something like that, there's always someone in the comment section going, oh, just memorize the lyrics, bro. Why don't you do the work and just memorize the lyrics? Obviously the intro is a bit tongue in cheek, but I actually want to discuss this topic about musicians using an iPad or a tablet on stage. I'm going to say iPad, but it's just going to mean tablet. iPad just seems to be the most common one that I see. So this probably ranks as number three on the list of musicians getting overly upset about how other musicians operate. The first one on the list is backing tracks. That's such a hot topic. People are very passionate about it, but I've already done a video on backing tracks. Second one is the never ending debate about amp modeling versus tube amps, especially if you're a guitar player like me, you're never going to hear the end of that. I also did a video on that. So while the iPad subject is not quite as heated as those other two topics, I still thought I would finish the trilogy and do a video about musicians using an iPad or tablet live. If you want a spoiler alert for this entire video and the other two videos, the answer is do what works best for your band, your performance to put on a good show and ignore the haters. Having said that, let's discuss the details. Before we get started, this is a music tech channel. I do gear reviews, tutorials, discussions about being a live musician. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, don't forget to subscribe. Also, I'm going to be doing a giveaway at the end of this video. I haven't done a giveaway in a while and I'm looking forward to doing one. So I will do a giveaway at the end of this video. So first of all, just to clarify, it feels like the big controversy about using an iPad on stage is for people to use lyrics and chord charts and stuff like that. If you're someone who's like upset that there's a tablet that controls a mixer or triggers backing tracks or triggers samples or is used by the keyboard player to get different tones and stuff like that, I, I don't even have the energy to go there. This is going to address more specifically using lyrics and charts and stuff like that on stage. And ultimately, I think it just comes down to does it enhance the performance or does it take away from the performance? And that's something I want to keep in mind throughout the whole thing. So I play in multiple different projects, all sorts of different styles and stuff like that. I have an original project. I play with original bands. I do covers. I do weddings. I do corporate events. You can't just lump all of those into a single category. So let's go over when I do use an iPad and when I don't use an iPad, because sometimes I do use one, sometimes I don't. So with my original music, it's a project called Spiral Cell. It's a one man band looping type of thing. It's a very theatrical performance. I have a light show that syncs up. I have video that syncs up. I wear different masks throughout the show. There's different characters and dialogue and stuff like that. In that show, no, I am not staring at my iPad. For that type of show, I usually perform like a half hour up to 45 minutes. Hour is kind of max with that type of a show. No, I'm not looking at lyrics or a chart for that. There's also another original band that I play with called Lola Black. Same idea. Most sets are a half hour to 45 minutes, sometimes up to an hour. It's a highly energetic show and it's a shorter set. A few years back, I was hired to do a tour in Europe with a metal band. Same idea, we had a 30 minute set. We were opening for a national act. Highly energetic show. Obviously, I did not have my iPad or charts on that one. So no, I don't need my charts or anything like that in front of me. However, those are shorter sets and I wanna keep that in mind. And I really do think that most people who are anti-iPad kind of fall into this type of a category. Playing, you know, 30 to 60 minute sets, with a very repetitive type of a set list. I mean, you might add like a new song that you learned last week or something like that, but it's not a whole lot of material. Nothing wrong with that. I wanna make sure, be very clear, I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying it seems like the people who are really anti-iPad tend to be the ones who fall into this category of music. And I do agree, I personally would not be using an iPad on stage for these kinds of shows. I would not wanna to go to that show and see they rally around your family with a pocket full of shells. They rally around your family with a pocket full of shells. I, I would not want to go see a show like that. Bear with me, though. Now, there are a couple of other bands that I play with. I have a 90s cover band. I have a band that I do with my wife. And I have like a corporate band that I play with. Those are the three main ones that I do. So my 90s cover band, we have about 220 songs. The band with my wife, we have about 150. And the, I just checked the Dropbox of that corporate band I play with. There's about 500 songs in there. Obviously, there's there's crossover with all three bands. All of us play Don't Stop Believing, believe it or not. But still, that's a lot of material. And the thing is, is that I don't need a chart for a large majority of those songs. Don't need a chart for Sweet Home Alabama or 
Don't Stop Believing, or Uptown Funk. Trust me, I know those songs. However, the thing is with these bands, all three of them, we like to feel out the crowd. And in my 90s band, we're called 90% 90s, and we actually hand out song request lists to the audience, and people will tip us to hear, you know, the next song that they want to hear on the list. So we don't actually even go in with a specific set list. So we have like five that we'll start with and see how they respond. And if they really like the rock stuff, we do more rock. If they really like country, we do more country. If they like hip hop, we do more hip hop, and so on and so forth. So in those situations, it's really helpful to be able to have lyrics and chord charts for a song that's like, we haven't done this song in over a year. That happens constantly. We have the main ones that we always play, but there's a lot of songs where it's like, oh man, we haven't done this in a long time. How does the bridge go again in this one? How does verse two start? Oh, I remember, now I can get through it. A quick glance to my iPad is not going to ruin the show. In my opinion, it enhances the show because there's more interaction with the crowd. You can cater more to the crowd of what they want to hear. And it's just like a quick refresher. Again, if I was staring at the iPad the entire time, sure, I don't, I, I don't think that's a good thing. But I don't think most people who have an iPad are just sitting there staring at it the entire time. It's to help them just remember, oh yeah, this is how verse three starts. This is how the bridge goes and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with that. Not to mention we use stage tracks three. And with that one, it's really cool because everyone can connect to like my session and everyone can see, oh, this is the song that's coming up next and stuff like that. I did a three part video series on stage track. It's actually my favorite app that I use for live performances. So if you are looking for an app that can do backing tracks, lyrics, chord charts and stuff like that, that's the app to check out regardless of what the people in the comments section are saying. Just memorize it, bro. So don't listen to them. Check out stage tracks. And, but it, it is funny because like how many times have I done Wagon Wheel? I can't tell you how many times I've played that song and how many times I just cannot remember how does verse one, how does verse two, and how does verse three start. I mentioned this in my in my tutorial about how I create my backing tracks, but I don't, I, did, I don't understand why I struggle with that one so much. And then I overthink it. If you screwed up once, then you, you always are nervous about it. So the way that I do my lyrics is I put you know, a one, a two, and a three, and I do them in different colors, and I bold them so that it's very easy to see, okay, headed down south to the land of the pine, I know where to go from there. So that can be very helpful. Again, I think it enhances the show just to have a quick reminder. So yes, having much, much more material, it's definitely valuable to have those options where you can reach into these extra songs that you don't do very often in order to appease what the crowd wants to hear. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So when I first joined that main corporate band that I play with, the first show that I did was about a four hour set and I had my charts on that one. A couple of months later, we played a sh massive show. I've mentioned this before on some of my videos. It's a really fun show. There's usually about 60,000 people who showed up. And I looked at the set list. I was like, there's about eight of these songs I don't have memorized. I bet you I can get these memorized because it's going to be a big show. I did. Had a great time. I always have my stuff memorized for that show. Also, just thinking about it, there's a couple of bands that I'll fill in for occasionally. There's one band that I fill in for called Top Shelf. Phenomenal band. They do a lot of weddings and corporate events. If you're looking for like a wedding band, they're one of the best ones. They're so good. They have a ton of mashups. They, they do a lot of mashups. The first time that I had filled in for them, I didn't realize there was so much material to learn. But it's also memorizing like the order of it. It's like, okay, so we go through this much of Jesse's Girl and then switch into the second half of shut up and dance but then you actually it, there's there's so many things that you have to memorize with that i did my work on it that's the thing a lot of people are like do the work and memorize it bro it's like i did but i also had my charts there just in case because there was so much to memorize for that show i did three shows with them that first time first show i had them there by the third show i didn't need to look at my ipad at all but it was there in case if i needed it a couple of months later i actually got a call from one of them saying hey one of our musicians their flight got canceled they cannot get here we have a gig tomorrow can you show up and do the gig i was actually available for it and i was able to do it so you're really telling me that the answer would be to say no sorry i'd have to bring my ipad so i don't want to do that i don't want to be a fake musician no i'm not going to show up sorry good luck or am i going to show up with my ipad because it's been a couple of months since i've played these songs and i just need a quick refresher in this situation i'm using my ipad and speaking of with stuff like that this is another thing that it makes me think that it's just like the people who are anti-iPad and anti-tablet, they apply it to the only the band or the music and the style that they play. So I'm almost positive that they have never done a jazz set or a dinner set during like a wedding or a corporate event or something like that. You're telling me that I need to memorize my jazz charts 
while I'm playing, while people are eating dinner and we're just there to add to the ambience during a wedding or something like that. There's no way I'm going to do that. I'm staring at my jazz charts. There is nothing wrong with that. It's just so ridiculous that people don't realize, oh, there's other types of music than just playing fog hat covers on the weekend. I'll do some shows where I need to be engaging in high energy and interact with the crowd a lot more. I'll do other shows where I'm more kind of background noise or just adding to the ambience. One of the singers I play with, he calls it wallpaper gigs, sonic wallpaper gigs. You're the sonic wallpaper of the event. And FYI, I do want to be very clear. I am not knocking the people who play, you know, 30 to an hour long set and they play the same type of set almost all the time. I am not knocking that. I can't stand it when musicians knock other musicians for what they do. Do what you enjoy. I am not knocking it. I am just saying that they seem to not understand that there's a whole nother world for musicians out there, and they're applying it to just what applies to them, which is a bit narrow-minded. You can do what you enjoy, just don't be so narrow-minded about it. There's another artist that I'll fill in for sometimes. He's a country artist. His name is Buckstein. Fantastic country artist. Definitely check him out if you're a fan of country. I specifically remember while I was putting this together, I was like, there's a really great example of this. There were three different shows that I did. One of them was kind of like a festival style show where it wasn't like like music was the only thing going on. There was a bunch of different other stuff going on. There was another show that I did where I got the call about like three days before. One player was not able to make the show, so I got asked to fill in. I have new songs to learn. I'm going to have my iPad on there just in case. I have three days to learn, you know, a 90-minute set. Some of it I've played before, some of it was new. I'm bringing my iPad to that one. The third one was opening for a national act, and it was a shorter set. So with that festival style show, I had a lot of material to learn for that one. So I had an iPad for a few of the songs that were a little bit more of a complicated structure. I had no problem using an iPad at that show. Neither did anyone else in the band. Then we got to open for a touring artist named Dylan Scott. It was a sold out show and we had a half hour set and I was actually the, the main guitar player. I was the only guitar player in that band. It's a half hour set and I was like, you know what? I can have this memorized. This, this isn't a problem. The funny thing is, is I did still have a piece of paper down below on the floor. There was one song, there are two songs in particular that just like, this is just like, don't forget you go here. I had a piece of paper with just some notes on the floor. Is that cheating? It's not an iPad, but I had, I did glance at it a couple of times just to be like, okay, don't screw this up. This is a bigger show. Don't mess this up. The show went great. It was an awesome show and everyone was happy. So I do agree that if you're just staring at your iPad the entire time, you're not engaging or anything, you're just staring at your iPad the entire time, I do agree that that's not a good way to perform. Again, with like dinner music and jazz sets and stuff like that, where your ambience, uh, there's really no problem with that. It really isn't. But staring at it during a show where you're supposed to be engaging, that's not good. Like I, I fully admit that that's not a good thing to do. The thing is, is that people who are anti-iPad, if you glance at your iPad at all, or just the fact that you have an iPad up there at all, they automatically assume that you're just gonna be glaring at it the entire time. It does seem to be a more tribalism thing where it's just like, I'm anti-iPad. The anti-iPad people just assume, oh, they're just gonna be looking at it the whole time. Or if you stare at it for like one song, they're gonna be upset about it, but the rest of the show, they don't acknowledge that you have the rest of it memorized. So again, just ignore the haters. You know, there's no way to make everybody happy in music. That's just part of it. A lot of this really just comes down to just being logical here. What you do in your band, doesn't apply to every other situation. And ultimately, just where I could wrap this up, it comes down to just, I can't stand how people are like, real musicians do this, or anyone who says real musicians do X, Y, Z. Like for example, some people will say, real musicians write their own music. It's like, okay, so the first chair violin player in an orchestra, which is just playing an amazing violin line that's not a real musician. There's just this such a weird opinionated thing with music. Just think about what you're saying first. Realize like, I mean, there's so many different genres and styles of music and types of musicians. It's just so silly to say one thing in an absolute form. Just recently, just this last weekend, my band, the 90s band, actually we played a show. It was fantastic, it was an awesome show. Big crowd the whole night. And apparently there was like two guys in the show who went to the owner of the venue to complain that we used backing tracks. And again, I've already addressed the backing track thing. If you want to watch my video on that, I have a video on that. The owner is a friend of mine who I've known for well over a decade. He put them in their place. But it's just like the idea of a musician just being like so mad that another musician, another group of musicians does things in a different way than they do it. And so they went to try to get us to not play this place again. Ultimately, it's just don't be a douche. Really? This whole video could be summed up in don't be a douche. Do what works best for you and your band. And if someone else is doing something in a different way, 
then it's not for you. But you don't have to be so dedicated and narrow-minded and tribal about the whole thing. So hopefully that makes sense. If you guys want to add to the conversation, please feel free to add down in the comment section. Did I leave something out of a situation that you use an iPad in? Definitely let me know down below. So I am going to be giving away three different $20 iTunes download codes. My logic to this is you can buy the full version of Stage Tracks or another app that you want to. This is just going to be for iPad and iOS users, but I haven't done a giveaway in a while and I definitely want to do one. Hopefully this will balance it out for all the people who ask, like, what's a good app for this? And all the people who respond, just memorize it, bro. Hopefully I can help like three of you out so that you know, hey, Stage Tracks is a great option and now you're able to buy it. So in order to be entered, Two things is one, you have to be a subscriber. So if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. And second, you have to leave a comment down below using the magic phrase. You can say whatever you want in the comment section. Just at some point, just say the phrase porcupine tree. One of my favorite bands, it's an obscure enough name that that way I'll know that you want to be entered into the contest. You have an iPad. I will do the drawing on this date right here. I will announce it on my community tab and I will also notify the winner. Please do not respond to scammers at all. Scammers like to show up when I do giveaways. I will never, ever, ever ever, ever ask you for money, period. So if anyone ever asks you for money claiming to be me, they are a scammer. I actually did a video on this specifically. So check that out if you're unfamiliar with that type of scam, but do not send anyone money. I will never, ever ask you for money. So that's basically it. Good luck in the contest. Thank you guys again for watching. If you found this video helpful, do me a favor and hit the thumbs up button. It does a ton to help out my channel and I would definitely appreciate it. Also be sure to check out my other videos on the debates of backing tracks or anti-backing tracks and also my video on amp modelers or tube amps. Kind of a similar idea of what we did in this video where I just kind of discuss where I come from and the pros and cons of each. So check out both those videos by clicking the links on your screen now. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Scott Yule Music. I post a lot about my shows on there, especially my stories. Thank you guys again for watching. If you have any other ideas for videos, please leave them in a comment section down below. Thank you guys again for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.